Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, so, hi, everyone. I'm Raichu. Uh, some people might know me from uh, a little bit of work I did on the Idris compiler and ranting on Twitter about various programming languages. But um, today I want to talk a little bit about, well, GHC. In particular, I want to talk about something that's called non-strictness. Quick show of hands, who knows what, what is, uh, who doesn't know what strictness, uh, non-strictness is? Huh? Okay. Laziness? Who knows what laziness is? Okay. So this talk is about laziness. And particularly, I come from a C++ background, and when I first started with Haskell, it was, it was a pretty weird experience, because there are a lot of things that are quite alien, and um, sometimes you think, okay, alien just, just to, uh, <laughs> Haskell just does this on purpose. It's just being weird for the sake of it. But there are actually re reasons why we do things different in Haskell. So today I want to explain what non-strictness is and laziness is, and why we would want it, because Haskell is pretty much the only language that really gives us uh, default laziness as, uh, as a production programming language, which is kind of odd. I would like to see more languages, so please implement them. And, uh, well, then I want to tell you how GHC actually implements that, because uh, I think it's kind of interesting. And it helps to reason about things like space performance. So, so how big is your program going to get? How much memory are we, go are we going to consume? Because there is this boogeyman of space leaks, like, ooh. This is, this is kind of like, this is a big problem for production stuff. You think, oh, my gosh, I, don't, my, I hope my program is not going to consume loads and loads of memory. So yeah, um, when I teach people Haskell and I ask them to implement the length function, they usually end up with stuff like that. So you probably did this, I did this when I started out. And um, well, you, you might spot the problem but, uh, right away, but um, I just want to show you how much memory this thing consumes. So what's, ha what's happening here? And uh, GHC has some pretty nice statistics, and you can run it like that, and you see, oh, this is not good. This, like, this, this consumes 632 megabytes total memory, and it's not very productive. So productivity means the actual work we do when a program runs. So this is just doing like 30% work. So this is not lazy, this is just doing a lot of garbage collection. So it's doing 30% of actual work, and the rest is garbage collection. So this is really bad. So when we look at this problem, um, so the problem is right here. So the lang call, it's not in tail recursive position. So if you study computer science and you are very smart people, and I dropped out of university pretty early, but you know probably a lot better what this stuff is, there's a thing that's called tail call, so tail call optimization. And we can rewrite our program so that we have something that is tail recursive. So usually we do this kind of transformation to, to really get stuff going. So what we have here, we have basically an accumulator. Um, I call that ACK. So there's this little go function, which sort of like acts like a loop. It's, like, oh, it's kind of like a, can you still hear me? Yeah. It's kind of like a for loop here. And this accumulator, we just add for every element we encounter in the list, we just add one. So nothing, nothing really spectacular going on there. So if the list is empty, we just return the accumulator. Otherwise, we're just going to do plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. So yeah, we're really smart. So we are kind of happy that this, this should make everything better. But it doesn't. It makes things worse. I mean, 903 megabytes, 10% less productive. What, what's going on here? I mean, that, that was me. <laughs> this is literally me. So um, this was really one of the reasons why I wanted to quit Haskell, because I thought I, I, couldn't, I, ca I cannot think about things like that. When you come from C++, you know when things happen. You don't necessarily know what's happening, because the language is quite large and there's a lot of stuff going on there, but at least you know when it's happening. So yeah, so I thought, well, there are two, there are two options here. I quit Haskell, or I try, I try to figure out what laziness means. So I went for option two. So what is laziness? And um, yeah, to figure out what laziness is, or in this case, let's first talk about non-strictness, because laziness is really like a specific implementation of non-strictness. 
So I want to look at a very, very simple function here. So we define a function, f, it takes two arguments, x and y, and it just adds them together. In the next line, we're going to use that. So we're not passing values here. These are just computations that I'm going to pass to this function. So this is 1 plus 1 and 2 plus 2. OK, good enough. Fairly simple. So let's look at the first way that we could evaluate this thing. So if you know C++ or JavaScript or any other programming language, this is probably what you would expect as a reduction sequence. So the first thing we do is we reduce the arguments. So we calculate the result of 1 plus 1, calculate the result of 2 plus 2. Then we call f with these values. We substitute them in, and we get a result. And then we cannot reduce anymore. So we reach something that is called a normal form here. So computation is over. This is not the only way we can do this. In fact, there are a lot of ways to do that. But first, look at, let's look at something that's called normal order. First thing was applicative order. I said, didn't say that. So what we do here is we basically we, we don't compute the values before we pass them to the function. We just pass in, we, we substitute in the computations as a whole thing. And then we evaluate this. So in the end, we get the same result. This is, this, is, this is pretty good. So it could have been something different. I think I'm losing my microphone here. Oh, OK. Pesky little thing. So we get the same result. And probably it could be something else, but there is a nice theorem that deals with that. We'll see the caveat later. So if we have a lambda expression e, and we have some reduction re sequence that reduces that thing to some lambda expression m, and another one that reduces it to a lambda expression n, then there has to be another one, z, which, which is like the endpoint. So we have this diamond-shaped property. This is called the church rosser theorem. And it, what it says is basically that every, every lambda expression has a normal form, up to alpha congruence. That sounds scary, but it's basically just we are renaming the argument. We can rename the arguments of a function. It doesn't change anything. So if you have the uh, lambda x dot x, it's the same thing as lambda y dot y. It's the same thing. So this is what this alpha congruence means. So what this basically means is the order of evaluation. It's it's not important, which is good. So we can pick any order of evaluation that we want to, and we end up with the same result. But this only works as long as the reduction sequence terminates, and termination can only be determined after the fact. So, sadly, we are not living in a perfect world. So, if you were vis uh, listening to, to Edwin's talk, he was talking about total functional programming where everything terminates. Yeah, we're not there yet. So, with most of our programming languages, we have to deal with this pesky thing called non termination. And, well, how do we do that? We do something that is called we lift the type. So let's look at something that is, in my opinion, one of the simplest types that we can start with that is actually interesting at all. We could use something that is even less interesting, but I think the Boolean is quite handy here. So we have a Boolean. It has two values, false and true. And what we introduce is another value. We call it bottom. So this is, a lot of times, this is, this is said to be like non-termination, and I think it's a little bit more useful to think of it as a computation that hasn't ended yet. Probably will never end, but in some cases, this is quite handy to think of, of bottom that way. I've seen various papers that actually propose that. Um, so now we have to establish some kind of ordering here, because if you, it's, it's a lot of people tell you we can think of a type as a set of values. If you ever heard of thing, uh, something that's called denotational semantics, um, these people are very angry when you say that. So there has to be a little bit more structure on our set to be actually useful to, to think in this kind of way. And what we do here is we establish some sort that, uh, something that's called a partial ordering. So this is not the usual less than than you know. It's, it's, I will pronounce this um, less defined or equally defined, and I will call it I will just say less than or equals, but keep, please keep that in mind. So bottom is less than or equals to bottom. And true is more defined than bottom. False is more defined than bottom. True and true are equally defined. False and false are also equally defined. So of course, this is not true if 
we had true, less than, false. This doesn't work. It's a partial ordering. You cannot compare everything. So now we have some sort of structure on our types. So you can play that game with pretty much everything. So what can we do with that? Now that we have the structure, we kind of want to preserve that. And um, now I'm going to introduce what's called a monotone function. So if in our domain we know that x is less than or equals to y, and we have some function f, then it has to preserve this kind of ordering. So if you ever heard Edward Kmet talking about every Haskell function is monotone, this is what he means. So it preserves the order of definedness if you go from one set to another, or one partially ordered set to the next one. So let's play with this a little bit. Let's define a function. Yeah, I know it's bogus, but just for the sake of it. In the case that the input value doesn't terminate, we return true. Although, otherwise, we just return false. So yeah, of course, this is go not going to work, but we'll figure out why. So we know that in the target set, this holds. Bottom is less than or equal to true. So what happens if we apply f? f bottom, f true, we get this. True is less than or equal to false. That doesn't work. That's not a monotone function. And as you can see, if we model our functions this way, in a monotone way, this kind of like, we, we cannot build a function that would solve the halting problem, because this function would basically do that. It would find out, well, the input argument doesn't terminate, so I'll return true. Otherwise, it would return false. So we kind of like save ourselves from that kind of function. So it's not really something that we can write in a programming language. So if we would, would do it like that, f always, it's a constant function. It would always return true. This is, of course, true again. We apply the function. We substitute everything. Yeah, it's monotone. And as you can see, even though I'm feeding in something, I, I could feed in bottom in there, which I do here, but it would still return true. So this wouldn't work in a, functional, uh, in a language like, like JavaScript, for example. If, I would, if this thing would not terminate, then the result would terminate. So when you think in this model of monotone function, this, this, this non-strictness feels, feels pretty natural. Of course, the same thing is true if, if we would just return bottom here, if, we, if it wouldn't terminate. It would still be a monotone function, of course. But yeah, I, I, I still think this feels more natural for whatever that means, so please bear with me here. So yeah, um, now that we know what the difference is between these things, what's, what's actually the advantage of having a non-strict language? Um, and there is something that's called the standardization theorem. And I'm fully aware that there are different formulations of that theorem. I just happened to pick the one from this book, and I'm not going to pronounce that name because I'm probably going to butcher it. But um, it basically says, if a lambda expression has a normal form, then normal order reduction terminates. So what that means is that we have when we have normal order, we'll have more programs that terminate. So if it will terminate any other way, so if, if there's some way we can make this thing terminate, normal order will find it, which is a good thing. We don't have to do any work there. And I think that's kind of nice, and it's pretty useful if it, uh, we're going to see this later. So yeah, let's talk about what non-strictness also does. So once again, very simple function. We just use x twice. And yeah, that's so strict. Everything works out as we expected before. But non-strict, not so good. Just imagine if x was a very, very complicated function and would do a lot of computation. We would do that twice. Not good. So even though we have more functions that terminate, um, we would do more work. That's not really what we wanted to do. We want, we, we want to save time. So um, now I'm actually going to introduce the concept of laziness and what that actually means. So laziness is basically non-strictness plus sharing. So what Haskell does, it basically introduces the notion of a thunk. And a thunk is a computation that is not evaluated yet. So it's kind of like a placeholder. Okay, this, this thing if you need it, and I will define what if you need it means, 
uh, this is basically just, okay, if you need x, please compute 1 plus 1, then save the result, and if you need it again, just ask me. So I'm, I'm kind of like abusing the let binding here to, to, to in introduce thunks. So what ha what's happens here is that we allocate two thunks, x and y. In the next step, we are going to force the value. This is what happening here, what's happening here. Then we're going to calculate it, and voila, everything works out. So are you still with me, or any questions until now? Oh, good. So why would we actually want that? Because as I told you before, it's, it's kind of a weird thing in a programming language. And I thought this was kind of weird. So I took this rather bad example of filtering primes. I've seen that a lot of times before, but uh, people always complain, that's not efficient, but that's not the point here. The point here is that I can model a complete problem space. So these are all the primes in existence. It would take a lot of time to compute them, but we just want 10. And here we can say, give me the 10 first primes out of this infinite sequence. So a coworker of mine, when he started programming in Haskell, he wanted to do something, he wanted to solve, um, solve a certain game. I don't remember what it was, but the thing that he did, he basically modeled the whole problem space and just took the first solution, which was pretty nice because he, there, is no, there is no termination thing here. This is just, this describes a whole space, of, a whole problem space here. And I think this is pretty neat. Oops. So yeah, we can do it that way. Another thing that I find even more interesting, and I took this one from um, Simon Marlow's book on uh, parallel and concurrent programming. Let's say you have a, a bunch of puzzles, and you want to solve them. So I have the solve function, and you have a list of puzzles here. You can, of course, map over this list of puzzles and get some solutions. In a strict language, yeah, we would do that one by one. So we basically committed ourselves to a certain evaluation strategy beforehand. We cannot choose anything else. But in Haskell, we're not committed to something. So we can say, hey, use this strategy to basically evaluate the list in parallel, to evaluate them, the spark off computations and do that in parallel, which I think is also pretty handy. I didn't change anything here. So this is the same program as it was before. So I can just add this using declaration, and I'm done. I think this is pretty useful. Okay, now, now, now to the biggest, the biggest point. And as functional programmers, we're a big fan of reusing stuff. Aren't we? I think we are. So we have this fold R that you probably know. Fold R just, it basically replaces the empty list with uh, the value right there, and replaces all well, with the value Z, and replaces all the, the, the const cells with F. So this is what it does. So in a, if, if this was a strict language, what would happen here? We'd basically, we would traverse the whole list. We would apply F to every element in the list. Even though we might probably not want it, well, any, we just want to find out, okay, I just, I just want to check if there is anything in there that is true. So, this would be bad if we had like 20,000 elements that would like traverse the whole list, and even though we would find one true in there, it would do a lot of work that we wouldn't want to do. So what most people do when they're using a strict language is they do something like that. So they basically use like this logical OR operator, and they are, okay, they know this, this thing's short circuits, and, well, they just recursively call the function. This is, this is okay, but... There's no reuse here. So we cannot reuse stuff like map or, or, or the or function. So if you have um, a lazy language, you can just reuse these combinators. So we can factor out recursion schemes. That is not so easy in a strict language. Um, and even Robert Harper, one of the... Who knows Robert Harper? Quick show of hands here. Edwin knows him. Um, he, he wrote a lot of blog posts where he was like, ooh, laziness, I hate it. Mm. Now, he doesn't really say it in that strong language, but he said, laziness has a lot of problems. And I agree. There are some, some things that are kind of icky, especially when we deal with things like C. But even he admitted that this reuse 
of, of lazy, in a lazy language is pretty powerful. And it's one of the things that he actually envies in Haskell. I've never heard him say anything like that before, uh, which is kind of remarkable. So yeah, as you can see, even people who don't like laziness know that we might have a point sometimes. So a little honorable mention here. Um, anyone read this book? Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? Um, so th there, is this, there is this chapter on amortizing, well, amortizing runtime, stuff like that. Um, and Okazaki explicitly states, you, need, you need, really need laziness to get this stuff going. He basically used ML to implement all these, all these uh, data structures, and he had to modify it to do this stuff that he wanted. He had to invent a new dialect of ML that basically introduced laziness. But we, we already have that. It's already there. And so I can highly recommend this book. It has a lot of very, very interesting data structures in there. And as, as you can see, nice points for, for uh, lazy data structures. So, okay, now we are slowly starting into getting to, into the realm of, of what the compiler actually does. So, how does GHC actually do stuff like laziness? And there's a lot of stuff going on if you compile Haskell. So, with GHC, you first you sugar, and we have this intermediate language called core, um, which is pretty, pretty small. It's, it's, it's sort of like it's a dialect of system F, if you heard of that. So we do a lot of optimization on the core, and then we emit something that is called SDG, which, is called the, which means spineless, tagless G machine. Um, the tagless is actually a lie, but I'm not going to talk about this today. So they use pointer tagging to do some optimizations there. So oh, um, it's a lie. So it's not tagless. And then we emit something that's called C minus minus or LLVM, depending on whatever ever backend you choose. So, but that's not important. And we are going to take a look at STG code. Because STG has this really nice property that you can learn a lot about the operational behavior of a Haskell program. You see when things get allocated. You see th when things get evaluated, which is very useful if you really want to reason about some of your space behavior. So, remember that I introduced lifted types. A lifted type is a type that has this bottom element as well. So how does Haskell implement them? Of course, you cannot use, to do that for int, of course you cannot use a machine int, because it might represent an infinite value. So there has to be some sort of pointer going on, pointing to itself, if we do something like cap, pl, uh, x equals 1 plus x, that would be like a loop that would never, ever terminate. So what, what we have actually here is we, this lifted type notion, and we have this notion of a box type. A box type is a type that can basically be represented by a pointer to a heap object. Um, yeah, so every, every, every type that is lifted is also boxed. The converse is not true. So if we have something like, like data int, which represents the, the, the int type that we all know and love, um, there are these constructors that we're going to see in STG. So there is int, int hash, um, which is, this, is, this is the machine integer that we're talking about when we are doing like computation. This is, this is like a pure machine integer that we can put into a register and compute with that. And there's this, this constructor around that. So in some cases, it would be useful to just compute with this machine integer. And I'm going to show you how that works. So now we are going to do something. The problem is here that I cannot see my screen mirror at the moment, which is a little bit unfortunate. So let's just try to do this. Make all. So, yeah. so I'm going to compile a lot of examples here. Yes. Now we're sort of like in the hand wavy part of this talk. So this is the first implementation that we first saw. And now we're going to find out what actually went wrong when we just allocated 900, almost like a gigabyte of memory to traverse a list, which is pretty ridiculous. I mean, that should be constant memory. So again, we built this thing, and uh, what I did as well is I turned on some flags, and it, this generated a lot of output. And let's look at the STG.
output. So don't be scared. This might look a little bit intimidating. But this is what SDG looks like. So I've suppressed a lot of stuff here. So this is the Go function that I'll just that I'll show you. And in SDG, we have this very nice property that allocation is always done with let. So we know when it allocates something on the heap. So we know when memory is, is consumed. And with case, we evaluate stuff. So we can have a closure on, on, the, on the heap, and we can do calculations on that. So here you can say we have this function go underscore whatever. It takes two arguments, the accumulator and another argument that is called ds. I'm just going to omit the stuff after the underscore. Then we're doing case analysis on that thing. So the first case that we have is, of course, the empty list. So we just return the accumulator after that. So the next thing we have is the const cell. And we're just going to use a look at the tail here. So what happens here is we allocate something on the heap now. We allocate this set, set for saturated or whatever. I don't know what that means. Um, and what this slash u means this is a func. This slash u doesn't mean lambda u. It really means this is a func. This is updatable. So up there you can see slash r. I think that means reentrant, if I'm not mistaken. So what this thing does, this is basically. Let's, let's try to make. Oh, this is really small. So this is basically the addition here. So you can see there is, there, is, there is some work going on here. And we pass that work that is in this closure, we pass this over and over again. And so we al allocate memory, and we're not consuming it anywhere. There is not a case statement that is, that is actually inspecting this computation. So how can we work with that? So, there is a sec function. And sec basically means f evaluate this, this thing to something that we call weak at normal form. Um, weak at normal form basically means evaluate un until you see the first constructor or lambda and then stop. So if, uh, if, if you have a list, uh, if you have x, cons, whatever, and it sees the cons, it, it, is just, it will just stop there. And you can inspect head and tail of the list, and it will not do more work there. So yeah, what's happening here is really hard if you got to watch your back here. Get the unoptimized. So this is this is what I meant. This is like this i pound. This is the, here here we evaluate to something that is a machine integer. So here you can see. We inspect the S, we have that calculation there, and here we actually evaluate what, um, what this addition means. And let me run that. So I should probably do it this way. Oops. And you can see the productivity just skyrocketed. And it's basically just constant memory right now. But while well, putting seeks all over the place, it's, there are a lot of problems with that. And um, it's also, so I went to ICFP last week, and um, there was basically a machine learning, a genetic algorithm, not a machine learning algorithm, a genetic algorithm that inspected code and tried to put sequence annotations into your code. It was, it was pretty interesting, but it took a lot of time, and you can't really use it on a big code base, which is a little bit unfortunate. So that will probably not be a good thing there. So there is a nicer way of doing that, and this is, of course, a language extension. Oops. Excuse me? Yeah, I mean this. And this is called bang patterns. So this bang actually means evaluate this argument. If you pattern match on that thing, just evaluate. And um, so this is basically doing the same thing here. Um, yeah, but that's also not good. That's also not interesting. Because, um, 
yeah, it's, it's, it's additional work and we need a language extension here. I would like to be able just to write the code as it was and um, not think about strictness annotations, actually. And this is what happens if you turn on a one. So remember this function. I'm just going to run it there. Uh -oh. ah. So, okay. So then, damn it. So, let's look at one. Let's run it. So this takes a lot of time. It's not productive. Let's just use the optimized version. So the only thing I did here was compile it with dash O2. That turns on strictness annotations, and yeah, that, just in case you didn't get that. This is the same program. You don't really have to care about this stuff. Turning on dash O does a lot of good strictness annotations. It doesn't do anything, but everything. It does, but it does a lot of very useful stuff here. So you don't really have to care about these things. And I think we still have a little bit of time, if I'm not mistaken. I want to show you something that I find pretty impressive. So this is... So, of course, uh, when you talk about Haskell, we have to show the, fact the factorial function. I mean, it's the Haskell talk. This is the only thing that we can use Haskell for. <laughs> yes. I mean, if you study computer science, this is probably the first thing that you see in Haskell. So here is the same thing with the loop. And of course, it has the same problems that I showed you before. But now I compiled this with, um, with optimizations turned on. And lo and behold, first of all, so I, what I did here is I didn't, th this is emitting a lot more stuff. So with the other examples, I did use uh, a flag that suppresses a lot of information. So this is like the whole, the whole thing that you will get. So, but what it does is quite remarkable. Look at this type signature. The arguments here are machine integers. This, these are int pounds. So this, this is like the, this is the go loop. And what happens here, wh when you see all these pounds, they're basically machine instructions. So this, this thing is a tight loop that works in constant space. And yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty efficient. And if you don't believe me, let me show you the assembly code that it emits. This is not modified. This is what actually gets emitted by GHC. This is the thing. Let's, can you read that? Should I make it larger? This is... Huh? It's, not <laughs> it's the color. Is it the color? Oh, it's assembly. <laughs> okay. I'm going to take you through this step by step. Be brave. You can do this. I mean it. This is really stupid easy. So, the first thing it does there's a register. It's like short-term memory of a processor. It compares the, the content of the register called RSI to 1. If this is jump not equal, this is the next instruction. If this is not equal to 1, we're going to jump here. Or, yeah, we're going to jump here. Then what we do is like, this is, this is, our, this is our counter. Um, for, the, for the factorial function, because what we do is we, we basically we multiply with our accumulator, then we subtract one, and then we do the recursive call, in this case, the loop. So what happens here, it, it multiplies our current counter with this, result, with this register, and then it decrements the counter and jumps back here. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to read from here. But that is, the, that is everything it does. If you throw something like a for loop into your... I, I'm, al I'm almost done here. So if you throw that thing, uh, a, a very simple for loop that computes the same thing into a C compiler, it will emit almost exactly the same code. So we can optimize a lot of stuff in our Haskell code. And it, we don't have to do that. I just wrote this like loop function, which is a very, very common optimization that we, Haskell, that we do in Haskell. So the compiler does a lot of things. So with a sufficiently smart compiler, we can do a lot of things. We don't have to do, have this in our heads, which I think is, is quite remarkable. So with this, um, I want to say thank you. Uh, bad pun, I know, <laughs> sorry. I didn't have that many 
very funny jokes today, but uh, I hope this is a good ending and I'm up for questions now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.